Okay, hello. Um, I, I thank you everybody for coming here. I would really like to thank the organizer for letting for having me here. So I am uh, uh, Piero Carnici from Lincoln Center for Life Science Technologies, um, and uh, I'm going to talk about the complexity of the mammalian uh, <laughs> transcription. So we are uh, at Riken, and uh, I have been here for about 18 years. Uh, and we've been uh, focusing in uh, developing technologies because we strongly believe that the technology development can help us to reach targets that were not uh, possible with the previous method. And in particular, we have been uh, focusing on technologies uh, to identify fibromans, uh, and uh, in, even more in particular, technology to uh, uh, capture full length uh, CDNAs, uh, one of the technologies called the CAPTRAP. Uh, and the second technology is called uh, CAGE. So we've been using those quite extensively. And uh, everything started from the problem that uh, in the mid-90s, there were no real good technologies to isolate full-length uh, CDNAs. So we were trying to, uh, to do this, but there were only technologies based on, on, on PCR. So uh, our group started very intensively to uh, develop those technologies, and there was a series of paper, technical papers uh, to select full-length uh, CDNAs in 96 uh, methods to make uh, very long uh, CDNAs by adding trailers to the reverse transcriptase reaction in 98, uh, methods to normalize and subtract it, so, so in order to uh, collect uh, essentially um, to, to uh, only uh, also rarely transcripts, uh, and also cloning vector that could accept uh, uh, very large uh, fragments. So all this set of technology be be became quite important um, in a project uh, the, uh, in which we started to sequence from the mouse uh, as many as possible ESTs, and then from that project we start to select the CDNAs as a full length sequence. So uh, we arrived uh, in the year 2000 with a collection of uh, uh, CDNAs that, that, that were fully sequenced. And then we started uh, one of the longest international collaboration that's called the Phantom. Function, uh, Phantom stays for fun, uh, functional annotation of the mammalian, uh, which means mammalian uh, transcriptum. And uh, we started in the, in the year 2000 and uh, to uh, get together with this consortium and start to look at the first set of, of uh, uh, 20,000 transcripts. We annotated them and we published the first catalog of, of mammalian CDNAs. And this was also very important at the time to identify in the human genomes, even if it was mouse uh, CDNAs, we, we, this was very useful to identify in the human genome where uh, the genes are. We continue our activity and in the Phantom II project, we were about one year and a half later, we published uh, uh, a much larger collection, 60,000 CDNAs, and also, this collection was very important to annotate uh, the newly uh, sequenced mouse uh, genome, where they also uh, the CDNAs were instrumental for the annotation of um, the uh, genes there. And we can be continuing, and we have additional technology in the Phantom 3. And the Phantom 3, uh, in this collection element uh, of, uh, produced by, by the genome, uh, show a, a clear uh, change of uh, direction, we will start to notice that, that um, uh, there were not only protein coding genes, but there were many, many transcripts, and more than 70% of the genome is transcribed. There's a plenty of sense anti sense transcript, and more than half of the transcripts are non-coding RNA. Then we uh, moved on, and uh, we kept working uh, particularly to use a, a sequencing, and this is was next generation sequencing, and using this uh, to um, uh, uh, decipher, to identify transcription network by just using uh, uh, sequencing based on, 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 on RNA. And this was the Phantom 4 project published in 2009. And at the moment, we are on the Phantom 5 project, still on publish, and we're going to have uh, several slides later to uh, discuss what we have been doing. So one of the key technology is called the CAGE, and CAGE is made to identify and sequence from, uh, as a high throughput method uh, CDNA and uh, at the five prime and at the cap site. And this is very important because we can really focus the signal on the starting site and on the promoter. And this is very important 
to um, uh, clearly map initiation site and promoters and give uh, expression value. The first version uh, went, uh, was uh, extensively using uh, PCR and uh, multiple steps uh, and, uh, and cloning in uh, and, uh, and uh, the first thing it was, was used by cloning in, in plasma, but, but uh, we went uh, quite uh, um, quickly into the Lumina protocol after PCR. Uh, but at the moment, we have protocols that can bypass the PCR and can just uh, use a cup selected CDNAs for the helicos uh, sequencing instrument, which is not working anymore, unfortunately, but also on the Lumina um, protocol, on the, on the Lumina instrument. So basically, we can sequence high, uh, high throughput uh, fibromand without having so much uh, uh, PCR bias. So, um, as a, a brief summary of uh, the um, discovery, uh, particularly on the, on the complexity, particularly this is a Phantom 2 and Phantom 3 work, we identified there was quite a lot of complexity, a lot of non-coding RNAs, uh, sensitive sense, and many promoters. So, uh, if I can uh, um, add a, a word to define that, I think that uh, the uh, <laughs> transcription is quite <laughs> pervasive, which means there is a plenty of transcription in many places that were not uh, 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 known to encode for, for protein coding genes. So, though if by analyzing our data, we, we found that, uh, that there is uh, probably 20, 20 1,000, no more than 25,000 protein coding RNAs that they encode for protein is a, a large number of uh, uh, transcripts that don't encode for, 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 for any protein. Those are CDNAs data. And uh, whatever uh, way you, we, we do for the analysis, we found that they don't uh, um, uh, translate any protein. So more than half of the transcript is constituted by non-coding RNA. And this is still one underestimation, because uh, the more we go deeply, the more we identify novel non-coding RNAs. And, uh, and uh, uh, this is very important is that uh, before we started the, uh, the Phantom project, uh, we didn't know uh, anything about them, apart from probably 100 non-coding RNA, particularly those in printed loci and so on. But we thought they were quite exceptional, but actually found that they're quite important. And there are many groups in the world now that are demonstrating uh, by, by experiments on individual transcripts that. Uh, uh, many, many of them have very important function. We cannot claim that all of them have a function yet. Of course, we will never know that until we don't test it. But uh, there is a growing um, role for many of the non-coding RNA. And this is a couple of papers that were based on, uh, on, on, the, on, on those discovery of transcript and including the uh, non-coding RNA. So, uh, because we have been focusing on sequencing, particularly full length or, or from fibromand, we can now uh, assess uh, uh, this kind of complexity looking at the fibromand. And this is very important to look at the initiation site than at the promoter site. So, this is one gene that, uh, that uh, is uh, mm, uh, analyzed by CAGE. Uh, 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 analysis, we can see that uh, there is one promoter, one peak, uh, green peak on the hippocampus, but there is another group of cage uh, on the somatosensory cortex, another group of cages showing the different specific initiation for the visual cortex, and the fourth group for transcripts that are specific for the cerebellum. And uh, some of the uh, protein lack some uh, uh, domains, so, so analyzing uh, uh, genes expression by looking at the fibromyn is very important, not only to identify promoter, but also to identify which isoform is expressed in which tissue. And this, you couldn't possibly do this using microarray with probes at the uh, fibromyn. So this is a very striking example how why it is important to measure the fibromyn uh, usage frequency by using a uh, cage. And this is a, a, a also quantitative way to uh, measure expression. So. The question next is uh, how many uh, transcription starting sites we have in the human genome. And we are assessing this now with uh, the Phantom project, particularly the Phantom 5. So in the various Phantom projects, we've been analyzing various transcripts if, uh, from, from many libraries. And uh, for instance, in the Phantom 4, we've been analyzing a, a one cell line uh, during the differentiation for, 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 uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a time course. Now in the Phantom 5, still unpublished data, 
we are trying to analyze uh, not only uh, differentiation uh, uh, through a time course, but also all the primary cells that we could possibly obtain by many uh, vendors and many collaborators. So we have uh, something like uh, 200 primary cells, uh, mouse and, and particularly human, uh, and this is very important because we can really assess the diversity of the primary cells. We also have uh, many time courses, uh, something like 24 uh, 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 very uh, 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 dense time courses of differentiation of uh, several of those cells or, or, or tissues. So we have uh, at the moment in the Phantom 5, we have uh, 100 primary cells and about 3,000 libraries that are deeply sequenced. In the, in the in the range uh, of a uh, few to few million to ten million tags, uh, all using a uh, helico cage, which is non -am non amplified. So there is a very nice quantitation of uh, uh, transcription starting site usage. And uh, because we do this, we can uh, measure expression using all the promoter that we identify. And uh, some of the transcripts are very specific. This uh, is the glial fibrillar CD protein, so it's a brain-specific tissue, it's glial-specific. We see that only few of the nine, uh, 947 libraries express uh, this protein, so the, uh, uh, the bars represent the level of suppression. Other are expressed at a little bit uh, a higher level, like the, the CD14. There is a, a larger number of uh, other expressing them. But also we have other like actin beta that is expressed essentially everywhere. So we will see that uh, if, if, if you scroll down, uh, almost all, all the tissues and all the libraries express the actin beta. So we can also plot uh, this graph in a different way, like horizontally, and, uh, and, uh, and see the distribution through all the 947 samples that are part of the first human analysis. We see that our glial fibrillar CD protein is expressed only in, in, in very few transcripts. And so the median expression is zero because, uh, because less than half of the tissue express it. But if you look at the actin beta, we see that the, the, the median expression is, is, is above zero. In this case, it's five, about 5,000 transcripts per million. And this is expressed essentially in all the libraries as uh, representing the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the x uh, axis. And, uh, and this is very important because uh, we, we can really have a, a very extensive uh, um, database of expression based on promoter, centered on each promoter for all the mammalian genes, uh, particularly in human, but also including mouse. We can also analyze uh, which type of promoter is responsible for expression of which type of protein. And uh, particularly now we can, uh, we can plot uh, as a first analysis, we, we can plot uh, the median expressions versus the maximum expression. Median is in the x-axis and maximum expression is in the y-axis. We can have a group of genes that are represented in, with the R1, which median expression is uh, above, uh, above zero. And, uh, and this means uh, that they, are, they tend to be housekeeping. There's another group of genes that is called the R2 that are much more tissue-specific or cell-specific. And they are very uh, differentially uh, uh, grouped here, okay? And there is a third group, it's called the R3, that is a, a t uh, promoter that are expressed at, um, at a certain level in, in most of the tissues, but in some tissues are expressed at particularly at, 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 at a much higher level. So it's kind of housekeeping, but in some tissue they are expressed at much higher level. So uh, we have uh, this catalog now, uh, all promoter based, but also we can also look at the difference of, of, of promoters. For instance, is R1 or 2 or 3 promoter, uh, are they promoted by different promoter elements? Is there any, any, any different, or are promoters used essentially um, everywhere uh, equally, but just that they happen to be more or less expressed? And this question can be answered with an answer where we see that um, in the uh, upper left quadrant, we see that a promoter uh, having only the data box uh, are very often responsible for the genes, genes that are cell or tissue specific. So there are very few uh, um, housekeeping genes. But if you look at the uh, top uh, right quadrant, we can see that there are many more uh, 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 genes that are housekeeping. 
and uh, they have a, a CPG island only, so they, they don't have a data box. So this is telling us that the CPG promoters are much more important for the expression of the housekeeping genes and much less important for expression of tissue-specific genes. Of course, we have two more um, uh, mixed clusters that, but I'm not going to discuss in details below that are represented in the, in, in the quantum below. So now we have this very um, very accurate uh, uh, database and we, we can analyze the promoter for the expression at each specific base in the genome so we can analyze uh, which base and uh, uh, which type of, uh, of promoter is responsible for expression of, uh, of each transcript in each uh, different issues and in this gene the, the big alt one we analyze about 270 bases at a very high Resolution, of course, this is done now uh, genome-wide for all the promoters. But in this case, we have uh, the first three libraries that are uh, that come from three different donors of human astrocytes, so from three different in, in individuals. And we see that all all of, all of the initiation start is focused around the single position around the, the uh, left part of the quadrant from essentially a, a single base. This is a very sharp promoter. But if you look at the uh, three following samples, the C14 uh, cells from donor one to three, so again, three different human biological uh, replicas, we see that there are other peaks more upstream, more on, on, on the right. And if you look at the CD4, we see the same problem, the same, that there is a further shift to upstream position. And finally, if you look at the S SW13 line, we see that uh, most of the uh, transcription is, is shifted to, to, to the right to more uh, upstream uh, uh, position. So this means essentially that the promoter element, uh, 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 promoter use different elements in different cells in a very reproducible way and that can be uh, very well replicated. And essentially promoter are not only a single element, but promoter are, 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 are composite of multiple elements that are um, essentially uh, in interchangeably uh, uh, used, but very specifically depending depending on the, on the tissue. We can also um, um, uh, quantify the expression at this point, and basically we can, uh, we have uh, programs to detect those groups of transcript and automatically assign them to three or four or uh, up to five uh, a group of, of, of initiation for, uh, for each promoter, and we can quantify each contribution. So basically, we can differentially analyze for each different contribution. This is quite important if you want to really look at the components of the promoter that uh, that cause transcription of, of 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 a given gene. Another view of this uh, is is uh, is uh, uh, in this in this hypothetical promoter. Essentially, we can now decompose promoters for the contribution of CPG versus starter versus other type of initiation. And, the, and each contribution, uh, we, we can say if it's specific for any specific cell type or if it is uh, broadly used. If you measure promoters in the mammalian this way, if you want to be conservative, we say we have 180,000, if you put a, a reasonably conservative threshold. But if you are very aggressive, and we, say we will put a very low threshold, we found up to or even more than half a million of um, such type of initiation site in the mammalian genome. This is a work in progress, uh, particularly uh, Alistair Forrest and uh, Hideya Kawaji, uh, uh, but of course many more members of the fund have also been involved in, in, this, uh, in this type of analysis. Now, we have uh, all of those promoters and we want to see if you can use uh, this kind of information to uh, reconstruct a regulatory network. I'm going to go back to the Phantom 4 to uh, uh, discuss the approach to do this. And uh, in the Phantom 4, we've been using CAGE to follow differentiation uh, by addition of uh, PMA, that is for bilmir steel acetate, to the uh, THP1 cells uh, that are kind of monoblast cells, become monocyte cells uh, after uh, about three or four days. You can see uh, the time courses, one, two, four, six hours, 12, and so on. And we see that the cell differentiated to a kind of uh, um, uh, monocyte cells after, after, after the, 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 the time has passed. Following by deep cage this, 
we, we wanted to characterize and want to see if we, we can use CAGE to identify a transcription network. The approach that, that, that we tried at the time was based on the following. Uh, so basically we had all the CAGE types, so we could map expression on each promoter. In the genome, we can, we can see a small part of the genome on the, on the, on the, on the left, and we, we, we could see promo, uh, all the various promoters. At that time, we have enough tags for about uh, 29,800 promoters. So what we could do with that, we could uh, uh, measure expression by counting the cage tags. So many cage tags means high expression, few cage tags means low expression. But now we have those uh, genomics element. What we can do next is to see if there's any motive around that. And in fact, there were various motives. Motives are, are uh, transcription factor binding motives. And one, two, three, and four, and five, and so on, up to uh, thousands, uh, depending on the number of uh, transcription factor that we have. Of course, not all the motives are known, but uh, Many of them are known and, and so uh, the analysis becomes possible. Now we can correlate motif with expression, and uh, Eric van uh, Nimwegen has been uh, uh, and, and his students have been um, developing a formula that correlates the number of the cage tags uh, per the uh, various uh, uh, motif and the reaction efficiency and activity of a given motif. And this is, there is a, a lot of mathematics here, there is a, uh, a lot of programming, and, and uh, so uh, I'm not going to uh, discuss in details, but uh, this was published by Eric's group. So, um, but what is possible to do now with the time course experiment is to determine all the relationship between motive during the differentiation uh, of, of, uh, between two, two states of cells. And uh, what happens actually, uh, we, we did this for the differentiation from monoblast. You can see from the, uh, on, on the left and the bottom, monoblast that differentiate into monocyte. And we can see this network that is represented by a colored cycle, and the, the, the uh, blue cycle represents motif, so transcription factor binding motifs that are responsible for a, a monoblast, for, for, for driving transcription monoblast. And during the differentiation, they become, uh, we, we see that they have the appearance of uh, uh, red and orange uh, transcription factor binding, motif, uh, uh, binding motifs, and those are responsible for the transcription monocyte. The white uh, circles represent uh, non transcription factors or uh, peripheral genes, and uh, they make quite a lot of sense because the, the genes controlled by the monoblast uh, motif are cell cycle mitosis and, uh, and uh, uh, cytoskeleton, while the genes that are controlled by the monocyte uh, motifs are inflammatory response, cell adhesion, immune response, and, and so on. And, uh, and also there's, there's uh, quite a lot of validation, of course, so when, uh, there's quite a lot of validation and, uh, by siRNA literature or, or, or chip that validated those, uh, those interactions. So now uh, we have established uh, this uh, motif activity principle in the phantom 4. Now we can uh, use this uh, for the whole phantom uh, project, and we can uh, actually derive for all the cells that we have a very large uh, uh, transcriptional network. And essentially what we have been doing so far is to identify uh, using a cage and network for uh, all the different primary cells and identify also novel motifs. We also been doing uh, RNA seq and so and the uh, and the small RNA um, sequencing from those primary cells, and uh, and now we can also have a, a discovery of transcript to identify uh, uh, gene models, long non-coding RNA that are new and cell specific and new in cycle processing. So essentially, we have. Uh, a set of transcription factor and a set of uh, uh, motifs that are important for uh, each cell, each primary cell to be a given cell. So uh, this is quite important now because uh, we can uh, identify exactly a cell. We can have a, a very, a, a very uh, good uh, um, uh, fingerprint or marker what a cell is. And so far, to analyze a cell, you, you've been uh, based on, on uh, many uh, subjective 
analysis like uh, morphology and uh, motility and ploidy and the surface marker, but very often those are not, uh, not enough to distinguish a cell. Morphology can change uh, and uh, many other, many other uh, subjective way uh, to analyze a cell are not really, not often enough. Now what we have instead is for each cell, for all the chromosomes, we have a, a very uh, detailed map at each promoter. Mapping each promoter has a very, very high resolution, so this kind of map has a, a, a very fine, uh, uh, it's very powerful to determine the position and to determine all the promoter, all the transcription at each base is much, has, has much higher resolution than, than, than a microarray and is much more clear than RNA sequence because this is anchored only in the session site which has a much higher resolution than RNA seq signals. So basically, we have all the promoter in the human genome, and that also we have all, all the transcriptional regulatory network that, that are responsible to make uh, each, uh, each cell. So, of course, this is a very good definition of, uh, of a given cell. We have this for 400 primary cells. One of the examples is, is that if you can identify such motif or just by looking at the expression of a transcription factor and the transcription factor that are, are overly represented like a, a fourfold or more than, than the average, than the median expression can be listed. And for instance, we have been looking at, at the Schwann cells and making a list and which is, which is on, the, on, the, on the table on the, on the left side, we can find that uh, our list includes a novel uh, uh, transcription factor, but also transcription factor in yellow that were already known to be important for the biology of the Schwann cells. So this is quite important uh, then to, you know, to, to really identify for each cell which transcription factor is responsible to make that cell, to control that cell. And this is uh, a very important uh, function for the regenerative medicine. We know now, now that uh, using transcription factor information we can reprogram cells, as, uh, as Professor Yamanaka has been doing, to, to discover the, the IPS cells. But also we can use the, this kind of information to differentiate each cell by using the transcription factor that we think is in, are important to, to create a given cell type. One of these applications is uh, not only to uh, differentiate uh, uh, IPS in a better way, but also to convert cells uh, from uh, bypassing the IPS step. And the, in this exercise, uh, my colleague Arukad uh, <laughs> Suzuki has been leading a project where he has been using this kind of network to overexpress uh, over a network of, of a destination cell into, into a starting cell, uh, all based on the, on, on, on the phantom analysis. Uh, and in this way, he could obtain from, uh, from a, fib from a, from a, from a fibroblast uh, directly monocyte cells uh, without going through the IPS cells. So this is very important so, uh, because IPS cells very often are, uh, uh, may have, uh, uh, may cause, you know, there is a, the potential to cause cancer by using IPS because they are, they are, they are really highly <laughs> proliferating and we don't understand them so well. So, so the potential to use this database anyway to create cells at will is very, is very important. Now I'm going to talk about the last uh, 15 to 20 minutes about um, the retrotransposon element, also because they are uh, the most uh, 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 have been considered the, the, the most junky part of, of the genome. Until uh, uh, well, we, we, we contributed in in in, uh, in uh, 2009 to, to to show that they are not really so junky. There is a strong logic in the expression of retrotransposon element. And up to 30% uh, uh, of, the, of, of the transcriptome, of the type of transcript, can be constituted in some tissue by a uh, retrotransposome element. So this is uh, published in Nature Genetics, just showing a heat map of mouse and human, suggesting that uh, subfamilies are expressed in different uh, cells, in different tissues, so showing a, a certain logic. And this is all published. I'm going to go fairly quickly here on these slides. This is to show that uh, the, retro, the, the expression of the retrotransposon is not, is not just a random, but there is a specific pattern. So basically, we find the uh, uh, full length uh, promoters, uh, anti sense uh, promoter with the, with the blue arrow. And again, at the triple end of the line element, we find one more promoter that expresses the transcript goes outside the, the uh, retrotransposon element and transcribes the genome downstream. 
So there is a, 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 a there are very clear uh, uh, pattern of, 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 of expression, not only for the line element, but also for the sign element and the other elements. You see, of course, you cannot see the details here, but what what the the figure is telling here is that each retro transposon element has a very specific pattern of sense transcription in red and anti-sense uh, transcription with the with the blue peaks, and, and those are very specific patterns, so there is no uh, randomness of signal, no fragmentation of RNA, but a very, very specific signal. And this slide is also quite complicated, but I'm gonna simplify downstream to, to just tell that um, those retrotransfers elements that are mapping just upstream uh, or just downstream to, um, to, to coding region, to RNA region, tend to be very often co-expressed while the retrotransposon that map far away from gene, uh, so-called intergenic, they tend to be much more silent, much more quiet. And so there is a clearly a co-regulation. And at that moment, we didn't know if this is a co-regulation that is a functional or it's just because they lie in the same gene and in the same genomic region and they are really just a co-mapping. Anyway, we have been um, uh, further studying the retrotransposon element. Uh, looking at the localization of RNAs, uh, and this was uh, uh, also a very important part of the of the encode of the encode project, and a particular collaboration with Tom Gengera's group uh, and the, the transcription group in the encode. We've been looking at the various fraction of the non-coding RNA uh, by analyzing with CAGE and other technologies uh, the RNAs, both poly plus and minus, from both cytosolic, nuclear, chromatin bound RNA, nuclear plus bind RNA, and uh, nuclei RNAs, and uh, by analyzing the transcript in this way, we could uh, really uh, map exactly potential function, we, we could screen potential function of those transcripts. So as, as a first broad analysis, we can distinguish uh, the distribution of RNAs, uh, and particularly between uh, 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 lowly expressed versus highly expressed, uh, and uh, nuclear versus uh, cytosolic, in this uh, first broad analysis, and we can see that uh, the known mRNAs uh, tend to be mostly uh, cytosolic and highly expressed, and the known non-coding RNAs uh, tend to be a little bit more nuclear and uh, less expressed. And there is, a, there is a, 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 apparently a third class, but actually this is a class that is a part of the uh, non-coding RNA that were not, but they were not uh, <laughs> discovered so far. They are uh, mostly nuclear and have a low expression level, and, and, and so for this reason, they, they, they have been quite uh, novel. So we can see, uh, uh, we can measure the, uh, for all the transcripts, uh, 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 we can have a measure of, uh, of uh, distribution, and is, it can also be called entropy, and entropy uh, suggests that if the transcript is, uh, is, has, a, has a high entropy, means that it is everywhere. And this happens for, uh, uh, particularly for the mRNAs that are in all the compartments that we have analyzed. However, if you look at the retrotransfusion element, they have a lower entropy, so it means their expression is restricted in a, in a very few compartments, or even a single compartment for many of them. And we can see the data also as a heat map. This is the heat map of protein coding genes. We see that in all the encoder libraries, this large green areas shows that most of the protein coding transcripts are expressed in most of the libraries, and very few are specific. But if you look at the retrotransfusion element, we see that most of them are not expressed, except a very specific library like an nucleus of KFAX is 2 or a cytosolic fraction of the case, say, KFAX, KFAX, KFAX 6 2 and, and so on. So they are much more um, compartment-specific and, and, and uh, subspecific and, 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 and compartment-specific. And uh, the same pattern is true also for the sign element and also for other elements. So if you can summarize this, uh, this is the, the, the encode paper, you can see that, for instance, line elements tend to be attached to the chromatin, while sign element they are not on the chromatin, but they are very much in the nuclear polynuclear and minus fraction, and alti element are a little bit more widely uh, distributed in various compartments. And all of this is 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 is, is a subfamily, so uh, is, and suggests that that you know, various various type of, of RNA have a, uh, may have a different function in in 
in, in different parts of the genome. And um, now we have also been uh, looking if, uh, if uh, those RNA may have a role in uh, reprogramming and, uh, and, uh, and uh, in stem cell. And uh, particularly in, in this case, we started with the project to deeply characterize the transcriptome in, uh, in a stem cell, uh, particularly human mouse iPS cells and stem cell using cage uh, RNA seq, a cage scan, and a small RNA sequence. And, and I'm going to skip a little bit uh, the details what you can do with each of the <laughs> technology because uh, probably you know already very well. But the key point is that uh, we have been making both nuclear RNA and cytosolic fraction for multiple replicas of mouse and human uh, IPS and stem cell and control cells. And we've been analyzing very extensively if we can find some of those no coding RNA that have some potential function in those, uh, in, those uh, in, 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 in stem cell. So surprisingly, we found that there are many transcripts that are only nuclear, represented here in, by, 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 the, by the green bar, both mouse and human. And uh, also another aspect is that uh, uh, nuclear and uh, stem cell have a much more uh, diversity of transcripts. If you look here and here, there, is, there are many more transcripts uh, in, the, in the nucleus than in the cytosolic fraction. And also, uh, in, in the stem cell, have uh, expressed many more transcripts than, uh, than uh, differentiated cells. What are those transcripts? And uh, many of them are uh, non annotated. If you look at the uh, red circle here, we can see that, uh, particularly in the nuclear and in the mouse, particularly in the, we have uh, many that, that are on a novel element like introns or antisense or intergenic, and uh, there is a very large function of uh, novel uh, transit that were not seen before in, in, in this complexity. Another important part is that uh, the novel transcript tend to be distributed usually in, in the nucleus. In the, in, in the, in the graph <laughs> below, we see that, uh, we see that uh, tiny orange line for all the compartments uh, and for, 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 all, all the, for all the type of, 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 of transcript. And we can see that, uh, that uh, the classic transcript, the map on transcription starting site, uh, they tend to be uh, equally distributed between nuclear and, uh, and the cytosolic fraction. But antisense and the intergenic tend to be below that orange line, which means that most of the transcripts are uh, restricted in the nucleus. So there's plenty of nuclear transcripts that are novel. If you look, uh, if they are novel and, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, or not, if they are conserved or not, we find that, that there is a, a non-annotated stem trust we call NAST that are less conserved, and uh, they often map on a repeat element. So, and, uh, but at the same time, they also map on, uh, uh, if you look at the ENCODE data and the epigenome roadmap, we also find that uh, they also mark uh, uh, active site of uh, transcription. So they should be there because they, they, they map either on enhanced mark or promoter mark or active marks, but they are novel, non-conserved, and very often on a repeat element. And we've been looking at uh, which are those elements, and we find that very often they are on uh, uh, alpha element, uh, particularly ERVK mouse and ERV1 in, uh, in human. And uh, ERVK are uh, those that are differentially expressed between uh, differentiated cells versus uh, ESL or IPS cells that are represented in, in, in the cell here. And I can quickly go uh, through this one by just telling that uh, those that are highly expressed are not necessarily uh, so much multi-copy, but are just, uh, highly, uh, just highly expressed because they are uh, largely used in, in, in stem cells. We also been looking at, uh, at uh, various other chromatin marks, uh, and uh, those that are transcribed have uh, very active chromatin marks like H3 and 4 methyl 3, while those that are silent don't have uh, those marks. And also, we look if there is any other uh, uh, correlation with uh, other uh, uh, transcription factors that are important for stem cell, like uh, NANOG, OC3, SOX2, and, and, and so on. Now, the key point is to make some, some experiment. We start to knock down those RNA that are, from, uh, that are produced from, from, from those uh, uh, NAST, particularly those with the ARVK element. For about one third of them, we see that the cell tend to differentiate into something else. So what we measure here, we measure um, the, uh, uh, we measure the GFP, we measure the 
fluorescence, and we see that the, the, the cells become less green if you knock down those NAST RNA. So those NAST RNA are important for keeping IPS uh, conditions. And uh, uh, here the case, one family, also here that the, if, if you uh, knock down the, the NAST mal R, we also see a decrease of uh, stemness. So those RNA are, are, are essential for this. So to assess the potential function, we try to see uh, a little bit more. And what we found is that uh, they tend to have a bidirectional uh, transcription. Uh, so essentially, there is both sense and antisense RNAs. And this is a feature of, uh, of many enhancers uh, that show bidirectional <laughs> transcription in a, very, in a very balanced way if compared to other genes. What we also see, we see DNA is at a sensitive site, and also we also see that uh, there are enhancer uh, marks uh, like uh, P300 and, and so on. So we thought that they might be enhancers uh, that uh, regulate uh, the uh, IPS state. So we further uh, been checking if those enhancers that are transcribed uh, are connected with, with the existing promoter, and in fact, they transcribe ERBK NAST show a very strong connection with many active promoters, while the silent one don't show any connection using the pol 2 chia pet uh, that were uh, provided by chia Lingway. And this is a, a also a map of which type of intrachromosomal or intrachromosomal uh, uh, interaction they do. But very importantly, the transcribed one from those uh, putative enhancer uh, project their signal, their, their interaction, to go terms that are very important uh, for, uh, for chromatin organization genes and the cell cycle genes that are very important for the, for the stem cells. So the models that are the, those NAST produce RNA, those NAST RNA are very important to control important IPS genes uh, represented by the red arrows. And uh, the basic idea, they are important to make stem cell and that they should be um, uh, knocked down or eliminated to further differentiate uh, stem cells. So we are working on this. We have a, a manuscript out there, and we hope to have a, a little bit more uh, um, uh, from that. The last part I want to talk about is um, a final uh, retrotransfusion element that was found to function as an enhancer of translation. And uh, this comes from a, a study where we are looking at sense antisense. And uh, uh, because we know that uh, uh, many, many genes have a sense antisense, they have a regulatory function, and we commonly thought that they may uh, control protein synthesis, probably inhibition of protein synthesis or this kind of, of uh, negative control. With uh, uh, Stefan Augustin, who's a collaborator, was interested in, in studying the antisense of UCHL1, uh, because this is a gene related to the Parkinson's disease. He has identified this antisense uh, represented in red, that is a non-coding transcript, while the green is, is, is the coding transcript. So if it transfects uh, the non-coding RNA, we can see, uh, we, we wanted to see if there is any regulation of, of, of the coding part. But actually, we, see, we saw no regulation whatsoever in the level of RNA of the coding transcript. So we were kind of uh, disappointed because we couldn't, we, we thought that we would not get a, any, any, any interesting uh, science out of this. But we finally measured the amount of protein. And surprisingly, we found that in the presence of the antisense, there is much more protein, tenfold protein or more, produced in the presence of the antisense. So there is a, no change at RNA level, but dramatically increase of protein level. So this is caused by additional one antisense. We start to, to dissect them. And to make the story short, we found that, that uh, there is a part in the antisense that we now represent with the um, uh, green box with one arrow. And this contains a sign with two elements in the antisense orientation. Now, if we delete the antisense uh, uh, and uh, 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 this is called the, the delta sign B2, we don't see this effect on protein uh, transition anymore suggesting that the sign B2 element was essential to uh, uh, see this effect on protein uh, transition. We next asked is if there are also other elements, if this is a single event in the genome, or if there are other of such, uh, of such element in, in the genome. And uh, we have been analyzing bioinformatically all the sense and sense pairs in the phantom project. And we found that there were other candidates, particularly between 60 and 150 candidates, containing 
having one antisense to protein coding genes, and this antisense contain a sine 2 element in the very same orientation. And uh, we picked up one of them, the antisense of the UXT. We overexpressed the antisense of the UXT. We saw on the right no effect on the RNA level, but we saw a, a visible effect in protein, on protein transition, suggesting that uh, there are not only the UCHL1 antisense, but also the UXT antisense, and probably many other are, uh, are important to control uh, and to particularly regulate and positively regulate protein transition. So we are in front of a cluster of transcripts. Of course, we want to see if we can use those RNA as a, as a biotech tools, um, and we, we transfer these antisense to other genes, like creating artificial sort of antisense to the GFP, uh, adding our inverted sine 2 element, and, if com and also we put, of course, control with the, with the scramble sequence. We can see that uh, there is increase of, uh, of GFP uh, only in the presence of the proper antisense, uh, but not in the presence of, of the scrambled uh, element. So, the, and also very important, though those uh, RT elements were discovered in the mouse, they also work in the human elements. So now we, now we have uh, those elements, we are characterizing others, this is quite a general rule, so we have a, a new class of transcript. Uh, by the way, the, uh, we publish in Nature uh, at, the end of the, the, at the end of the last year, this, this work. But now we can transfer this property by just changing the overlap to uh, almost any gene in, uh, in, uh, in mammalian so far. We can overlap with uh, all the possible various RNAs and uh, essentially create a universal adapter to enhance protein transition. Essentially, uh, the, uh, those RNAs we call the synapses, like sign element that upregulate uh, translation. They can work to as a, as 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 a, as a tool that is is the contrary of the uh, microRNA or siRNA. And we think that this can be important for uh, production of proteins, enzymes, and so on. Okay, so I'd like to uh, briefly uh, summarize uh, uh, some of the key points here. So I hope that uh, I hope that, uh, that, that that you can appreciate now that cage is a, is a is a is a very fine way to map a promoter and to really understand the um, transcription center on fibromand. There, there are many advantages for doing that because we can reconstruct network, identify uh, markers identify architecture of uh, promoters in much much better than, than with other methods. We also uh, have seen that retrotransfers element are, are broadly expressed and uh, they have a various function. I, 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 I touch upon, upon some of them, but uh, it's, very, it's, very, it's very clear that uh, the future will show that uh, they will be that they will have a growing element to regulate uh, uh, the uh, uh, no the, the transcriptome to regulate various uh, no to, to regulate various aspects to be like enhancer. They can also work in trans. They can uh, um, uh, I didn't I didn't <laughs> discuss much, but uh, there are uh, other uh, other role of reproductive element to to um, regulate genes and also. As a sign element in, in antisense uh, transcription, they can um, uh, control uh, 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 translation. So I represented the work of many people. This is the Phantom Consortium. And actually, there are many, many, many names that have been contributing. I really apologize because I cannot really um, read all of them. And there are close collaborators uh, and, uh, that, uh, uh, that are in, in key labs, and also many. Um, Many funding from both uh, Japan and and uh, and the U.S. and uh, Europe. And uh, show a couple of pictures if you have interest uh, in uh, Japan and in Yokohama. If you want to, uh, or if you are a postdoc and you want to join us, please consider uh, this uh, 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 the, the possibility here. And I'd like to really thank you for your attention. I'm opening to uh, to to for, for question and and answer. Okay. Okay, the first uh, question is, uh, by what mechanism do you think the sin B2 antisense enhances um, translation? Is it in initiation or elongation? Uh, this is a question from Vince Mauro at the Scripps uh, uh, Research Institute. So, um, okay, 
The answer is that uh, we have been uh, uh, we have been working um, to see if if those uh, um, uh, uh, transcript interact with the uh, with the polysomes. So essentially, uh, uh, so I, did, I didn't uh, uh, <laughs> discuss it, but we saw uh, that in the presence of an antisense, we saw that uh, both sense and antisense interact with with the uh, with the uh, long uh, um, uh, 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 with the, sorry with, with the large fraction of the polysomes, suggesting that uh, they help to initiate uh, uh, translation at a much higher efficiency. So essentially, it is a uh, uh, initiation. Uh, Initiation that is uh, is um, is um, is is uh, enhanced. We also uh, see that those uh, um, the the sign bit two has a one 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 element. Uh, essentially, that has a, a structure that uh, re resembles some somehow a tRNA. So we think we, we we don't know exactly the mechanism we are investigating now, of course, but uh, we believe that is uh, something related to the um, translation. Uh, okay, I I don't I don't have uh, any um, any any other question at the moment, and uh, I I would like to have uh, I would like to know if uh, if someone else has uh, any any additional questions. So I'd be very happy to to answer to them. If uh, if you don't have any question now. Please feel free to write me one email at carnici at uh, My email address is in, in, in the last slide. And uh, uh, I understand that many of you at the moment are probably in the, in the, in the, in the, in the particular in the, in the East Coast, uh, are probably uh, quite late in the evening and probably you, you're, you're not connected. But I hope that, uh, that many of you will eventually uh, look at this video after, after, the, after the presentation. And um, well, I will wait uh, still a couple of minutes to see if there is any other any other question that may uh, come. Uh, okay, there there is there is a, there is a question: Is a database to uh, to query to identify promoter of uh, interest in uh, in a gene? Okay, and I okay. Is there any database that uh, can be uh, used to uh, that contains the uh, the cage tags. Now uh, we are working on that, uh, and uh, at the moment we have um, uh, previous databases uh, uh, like the Phantom Three, the Phantom Four, that are open to the public, where you can query, um, um, where we can query the uh, um, the uh, expression genes in in, in uh, various uh, tissues. The whole collection is not yet uh, fully available. Uh, also, because uh, uh, we have not published that, uh, usually our, our policy at RICAN, we are not NIH funded, our policy at RICAN is to open the data uh, uh, without any restriction, without any condition, but at the time of, of, uh, of uh, the publication. So now, we hope to, to be there quite soon. We have a manuscript that is under review at the moment, and I cannot tell much more how it's going, but uh, as soon as we can, we open this database, which will contain uh, a easily, hopefully easily searchable uh, database of all the promoters for all the mouse and the human gene. Okay, mm, uh, th thank you for the question. And uh, uh, the next question is that, do you see a possibility in the future of understanding full temporal expression complexity? This is a, uh, another very important question, and uh, the key point, uh, the key point here is that uh, uh, the question is a very much temporal. Uh, temporal, yes, for sure, we can understand the temporal expression. Um, the problem is that can we understand the temporal expression in each cell, in each uh, organ? And uh, how many cells should we uh, profile? So uh, currently, so if if we want to uh, measure just the average expression of cells in one one organ, 
this is probably uh, quite possible uh, to do with the current technology. Uh, I, I would suggest that to, to use Kate because we can easily anchor on the promoter and reconstruct it, 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 that data script expression later. But I would say, uh, I would say, uh, I mean, that will be a matter of time and a matter of money. Uh, understanding single cell um, expression with unbiased methodologies is much more uh, is much more a challenge because at the moment we have various methods that are based on application. However, the problem there is that we very often we don't we we, we miss many transcripts, particularly uh, long non-coding RNAs, and and those transcripts are, cannot be uh, reproducibly detected by uh, PCR based method. So I think that we should work uh, very hard to have a um, very high efficiency capture methods that can capture uh, rare transcripts uh, from individual cells and, and be able to profile them at very high efficiency. So at Rican we are working on that. There are probably other people in the world working on that. And this is probably the real challenge. Of course, we also need to address uh, the uh, transcription to um, not a few cells, but probably uh, uh, several thousand or ten thousand or possibly hundred thousand cells for for each asset in, in, in and, and and this is probably quite a, quite a, a, a big challenge but um, I think that uh, the field is, is also moving there is a lot of competition which is probably good and and uh, really looking forward to see the, the developments in this area <clears throat> um, there is uh, uh, no questions uh, uh, available at the moment. Uh, I would like to encourage uh, people if uh, people has uh, any any additional question, uh, please. And if not, I probably should just go back on the acknowledgement and and talk for the remaining few minutes about um, the contribution of individual people, but particularly um, Alistair Forrest uh, has been uh, contributing uh, greatly for the Phantom Five, and his uh, particular mention to 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 him. Of course, also uh, Yoshida Hayashizaki has been uh, um, uh, very much a visionary behind the. Uh, the Phantom Project, and of course, I'd like to mention the labs of key collaborators like Tom Dinsera, Sissa, uh, uh, and uh, many, many more like uh, 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 Roslyn with Jeff Faulkner and uh, David Hume, uh, iPhone, uh, and, uh, and and many, many, many more that are not in this list. And um, particularly, we are also funded by uh, Next, which is in Japan, NIH, Indian Code, the Modern Code Project. Uh, JSPS is the Japanese Japanese agency for for uh, uh, promotion of of, of science. Uh, you um, uh, the <laughs> seventh framework, framework and other funding. Okay, there is one more question. So, and the question is from uh, Steve Stoffer. And um, may have missed, but uh, did you comment on microRNA in your talk? And actually, no, I, I didn't talk so much about microRNAs. Uh, uh, also, because uh, I, we believe that they are important, but that there are many more people that are that have many more original work on that. So I prefer not to not to not to comment very much on them because uh, I mean uh, I prefer to comment very much on uh, on on RNA for what we have original data and. Uh, Thank you for the question. Okay, I guess uh, I guess that we are uh, essentially done. So I really would like to thank uh, everybody for being here, for being in, the, in this talk, and uh, and uh, I I hope that again 
that you can uh, uh, that you can contact uh, uh, me if you have any any additional questions. Thank you very much.